Hey everyone, and thanks for coming. Uh, we have two great talks for you today. Uh, but before that, a couple of announcements of interest to the community. This month's Myco Talk is coming up on May 26th. Uh, and the two speakers will be Ann Poole, who will be talking about IL-17 immunity, and Michelle Mominy, who will talk about conidial dormancy and germination in Aspergillus. I'll put, those are free to sign up for, and they're uh, by Zoom, so I'll put the information in the chat. There are also a couple of in-person meetings coming up that might be of interest to the community. Um, one of them is the uh, meeting on the evolution of fungal pathogens, which is at the end of May, May 25th and 26th uh, in Quebec and I'll, Canada. And I'll put information about that in the chat. And then in June, there is a Gordon Research Conference and accompanying Gordon Research Seminar for trainees on uh, uh, the cellular and molecular fungal biology. Uh, and I'll put information on the, in the chat about that as well. Uh, so. Our first speaker today is Kala Telsro, who is coming to us from Duke University. Um, Kala earned her BS in biology from High Point University, where she performed research in diverse fields in, from entomology to synthetic organic chemistry. Um, she was attracted to Duke by the uh, diverse research performed there, and has recently completed her PhD in Andy Allspaw's lab. Um, right now, Cal is on the job market, where she's balancing her passion for science and looking for postdocs, but also looking for uh, science communication positions. Um, so please reach out to her if you have any comments on those. Um, but first, she's going to tell us about her PhD work. Uh, so Cal, please take it away. Thank you, Jessica. Okay, so um, I feel really... Uh, really thankful to have the opportunity to share a bit of my thesis work in such a special special forum today. Um, and I'll start by uh, drawing your attention to this scanning electron microscopy image that's showing the human fungal pathogen, Cryptococcus neoformans, being phagocytosed by a macrophage. And I like to start uh, my talks with this image because I think it's a really beautiful summary of the goal of the work in uh, the Allspa lab, which is to understand how Cryptococcus neoformans interacts with and causes disease in the human host. And one of the reasons that Cryptococcus, uh, cryptococcal pathogenesis is so interesting is because Cryptococcus is actually an environmental fungus. Unlike most environmental fungi, Cryptococcus neoformans has the unique ability to cause disease in humans. And of course, in doing so, um, Cryptococcus has to adapt to very diverse conditions when going from the external environment to the mammalian host. And these condition changes include things like temperature, pH, and even nutrient availability. Cryptococcus is able to adapt to these drastic conditions by employing adaptive cellular responses. And many of these adaptive cellular responses uh, are, can simply be observed by looking at the surface of the fungal cells. So for example, when Cryptococcus enters the human host environment, it begins to employ a polysaccharide capsule, which can be thought of as a sugar shield to hide the fungal cell from immune detection. Cryptococcus uh, can also form uh, titan cells by drastically increasing their cell size, which provides many uh, advantages in vivo, uh, including making it more difficult for uh, immune cells to phagocytose the fungal cells. In order to accommodate these variance factors and many others that I didn't mention here, the cryptococcal cell wall undergoes drastic remodeling in response to the human host environment. I'm showing a few transmission electron microscopy images. And if you look at this electron dense portion of the cell, the cell wall, uh, it's obvious that the cell wall undergoes a drastic thickening in response to the human host environment. And so because this cell wall remodeling supports the elaboration of many other virulence factors, the OSPA lab has been particularly interested in understanding this process of cell wall remodeling and its implications on cryptococcal pathogenesis. And so um, years ago, there were multiple members of the Alspa lab who performed a four genetic screen to identify mutants with uh, defects in cell wall remodeling. And through this process, they identified a gene of unknown function that is required for cell wall remodeling. And they named this gene MAR1. MAR1 was completely uncharacterized at the time of identification. All that they could discern was that it was it encoded a cryptococcal uh, specific protein, uh, which of course they named MAR1, and that this protein contained a domain of unknown function that harbored two transmembrane domains. 
a former Osvaldo graduate student, Dr. Shannon Asherigi, who actually spoke here a few months ago about her postdoctoral work at Tulane University, uh, became really interested in understanding the role of MAR1 in cell wall remodeling. And so I'm going to very, uh, very br uh, briefly summarize a lot of the fantastic work that Shannon did during her PhD. And if you're interested, her, uh, the full story about MAR1 is, uh, can be found in POS pathogens. But um, Shannon found that in response to in vitro host-like conditions, that the wild type strain undergoes a drastic cell wall remodeling, similar to what's observed uh, in vivo. And this involves um, a thickening of the middle layers of the cell wall, largely the beta and alpha glucan layers, which enable the polysaccharide capsule uh, to attach and shield highly immunogenic components of the cell wall, like the basal components, uh, chitin and chitosan. Shannon found that the MAR1 mutant strain was unable to undergo the same drastic remodeling. And uh, specifically, it's not able to evenly thicken its uh, cell wall, particularly the beta-glucan and alpha-glucan layers. And because of this, the MAR1 mutant strain has reduced capsule, and it also has increased exposure of uh, immunogenic chitin epitopes on the cell surface. And so with these drastic changes in the cell surface, we did expect some changes in the pathogenesis of the MAR1 mutant strain as well. And so to explore this, we use the inhalation model of murine cryptococcal infection and tracked mouse survival following infection. And as typically is observed in this model, mice that were inoculated with the wild type strain and the MAR1 complemented strain all succumbed to cryptococcal infection within 30 days post inoculation. And this murine death was actually due to rapid fungal proliferation throughout the lung, which can be observed by looking at a gross view of lungs harvested from a wild type strain inoculated mouse at the time of death, which is characterized by diffuse damage throughout the entirety of the lung tissue. Mice inoculated with the MAR1 mutant strain, on the other hand, survived significantly longer, with nearly half of the mice surviving to the end of the experiment. And we actually looked at the gross view of the MAR1 mutant strain inoculated lungs. We observed a very different pathology. In stark contrast to wild type strain inoculated lungs, the MAR1 mutant strain inoculated lungs displayed large globular foci of inflammation, which are um, highlighted or uh, pointed to with these white arrows. And these um, glo globular regions of inflammation are clearly demarcated from healthy lung tissue. And so this is a really uh, kind of you know, surprising and striking observation because it looked very similar to pathology that's typically observed in human cryptococcal infections. And so typically when uh, an immunocompetent person becomes inoculated with cryptococcus from the environment, they don't show any symptoms or signs of disease. And this is because when this individual inhales spores or desiccated yeast into their lungs, immune cells like that macrophage I showed on the first slide are able to quickly detect and phagocytose cryptococcus at the site of infection. And through this process, um, the immune system forms this structure in the lung called a granuloma. And these granulomas can simply be thought of as palisading foci of inflammation that contain fungal cells within their perimeters. And traditionally, they've been thought of as a host immune protective mechanism to prevent cryptococcal proliferation and dissemination. However, if an uh, individual with cryptococcal granulomas becomes immunocompromised at any point in their life, these granulomas can break down, releasing viable fungal cells that proliferate throughout the lung and disseminate to the central nervous system, causing lethal cryptococcal meningitis. And so because of this, these granulomas can also provide a reservoir for infection uh, for cryptococcus, thus resulting in a more chronic infection in the lung. And so with this in mind, uh, the, we know that the standard mouse infections that we use in the lab are not really replicating the typical course of human disease. Infections with the wild type strain create more of a primary or acute infection in which there's rapid fungal proliferation and dissemination leading to murine death pretty soon after uh, inoculation. But infections with the Marrow mutant strain, on the other hand, seem to more closely mimic the typical course of human disease uh, just by the appearance of these globular foci of inflammation, because they looked, and they looked from you know from this growth, gross um, view somewhat like human granulomas, and so we really wanted to know first of all if these truly were granulomas, and furthermore if they were how these structures were forming, and so to do so uh, we repeated these murine infection experiments, 
But we sacrificed mice at these predetermined time points uh, in order to examine three features of fungal pathogenesis, or uh, three features of fungal pathogenesis, lung histopathology, lung fungal burden, and lung leukocyte and cytokine uh, responses. And so this work was just recently accepted for publication um, and was only made possible by a really fantastic collaboration with the uh, Wormley Lab at TCU with much of the immunological work done by Dr. Natalia Castro Lopez. And so just to be mindful of time today, I just wanna highlight a few of the interesting findings we made at each of these time points. Um, and then at the end of the talk, kind of hypothesize about um, what we think these findings may suggest about granuloma formation in human cryptococcal disease. And so I'll start first at three days post inoculation. And this is an early time point in infection in which all inoculated mice are still very healthy appearing. And because of this, there's not many differences when we actually look at the lung histopathology by H and E staining. Lungs of mice inoculated with the wild type strain and the Marwan mutant strain both appear to have low levels of inflammation and largely healthy lung tissue characterized by clear alveolar spaces. The only obvious difference at this early time point is the appearance of fungal cells. So the wild type fungal cells uh, are, appear to already begun a Titan transformation and they're very readily apparent in the lung tissue. And this is pretty different to the lung tissue in MAR1 mutant strain inoculated lungs. Uh, the MAR1 mutant strains, uh, the MAR1 mutant cells were uh, kind of difficult to find in the tissue. And when we were able to find them, they didn't appear to show any signs of titanization. And this observation was actually supported by our fungal burden analyses. Um, so despite the fact that we inoculated all mice with the same number of fungal cells, uh, we observed that the MAR1 mutant strain inoculated mice already had a tenfold decrease in pulmonary fungal burden compared to wild type strain inoculated mice. Despite this decrease in fungal burden, MAR1 mutant strain inoculated mice actually had a uh, slightly more robust pulmonary leukocyte and cytokine response with the vast majority of tested immune cells and cytokines being more abundant in the MAR1 mutant strain inoculated lungs than in the wild type strain inoculated lungs. By seven days post inoculation, a uh, time point in which some wild type inoculated mice begin to show symptoms and signs of disease, but MAR1 mutant strain inoculated mice are still very healthy appearing, we begin to see some important differences in lung histopathology. So wild type strain inoculated lungs actually begin to show early signs of granuloma formation. And so this can be observed by these foci of inflammation that are clearly demarcated from surrounding healthy lung tissue. These granny, if you kind of zoom into these granulomatous regions, we see that they do contain wild type fungal cells, but they appear insufficient or ineffective in containing fungal proliferation because we can readily identify uh, wild type fungal cells outside of the border of these granulomas. Uh, the MAR1 mutant strain inoculated lungs at this time point look very similar to what we observed at three days post inoculation in which the lungs are largely healthy appearing with a few MAR1 mutant fungal cells visible in the lung tissue. When we assess lung fungal burden at this time point, we continue to see a disparity in fungal burden. And now we observe a 100 fold decrease in fungal burden in MAR1 mutant strain inoculated lungs compared to wild type strain inoculated lungs. And because of this sustained and enhanced reduction in fungal burden, we now begin to see that MAR1 mutant strain inoculated lungs have a slightly dampened pulmonary leukocyte and cytokine response with most tested immune cells and cytokines being slightly less abundant in MAR1 mutant strain inoculated lungs than in wild type strain inoculated lungs. And then by 14 days post inoculation, um, we've reached a, a kind of a middle time point in infection in which wild type strain inoculated mice begin to succumb to fungal infection, um, while all MAR1 mutant strain inoculated mice are still healthy appearing. And we observe probably the most striking differences in pathology at this time point. So in wild type strain inoculated lungs, uh, we see that the, the lung tissue is highly diseased. The immature granulomas that we observed at seven days post inoculation have completely disappeared. And as a result, uh, all the previously clear alveolar spaces are now filled with immune cells and fungal cells, which appear highly titanized and with uh, large amounts of elaborated polysaccharide capsule. 
In contrast, MAR1 mutant strain inoculated lungs begin to show signs of early granuloma formation. And so again, we begin to see these palisading regions of isolated inflammation that are clearly demarcated from the surrounding healthy, uh, healthy lung tissue. And uh, compared to the immature granulomas we observed in wild-type strain inoculated lungs, these granulomas are larger and have much more defined borders. And as a result, they're, they appear to be more efficient in containing fungal cells. As these very small, non-titan MAR1 mutant cells are found within the borders of the granulomas, but we are, are not able to find them outside of the borders of these regions. We continue to see a sustained and uh, enhanced reduction in fungal burden in MAR1 mutant strain inoculated lungs compared to wild type strain inoculated lungs with about a thousand fold decrease in fungal burden um, at 14 days post inoculation. And as a result, uh, we continue to see that MAR1 mutant strain inoculated lungs have a dampened pulmonary leukocyte and cytokine response compared to wild type strain inoculated lungs at this time point. And then lastly, we, um, we also assess the pathology of the MAR1 mutant strain inoculated mice that survive to the end of the experiment, so to 40 days post inoculation. And we find that these mice contain um, mature pulmonary granulomas. We worked with a, a really fantastic lung pathologist at Duke University who frequently sees cryptococcal granulomas in humans. And he was able to confirm that structurally, these granulomatous regions look very similar to uh, granulomas that are frequently observed in human cryptococcal infections. And um, in that these granulomas similarly are characterized by um, macrophages, dendritic cells, and an outer ring of lymphocytes. These regions also contain characteristic features of granulomas, including multinucleated giant cells, epithelioid macrophages, and uh, viable fungal cells contained within the borders of the regions of the granuloma. And so from this really very simple uh, infection experiment, we were able to construct a timeline of pathogenesis in both wild type and wild type strain and MAR1 mutant strain infections. And so we found that in wild type uh, strain infections, there is an early induction of immature granuloma formation as early as seven days post inoculation. But this, uh, this initial granuloma formation is ineffective. And as a result, wild type cells are able to proliferate outside of the borders of the granulomas, leading to um, fungal dissemination and eventually mirroring death within 30 days. Infections with the MAR1 mutant strain, on the other hand, are characterized by early reductions in fungal burden, but a paradoxical increase in the immune response at three days post inoculation. And this later manifests into mature pulmonary granulomas um, as early as 14 days post inoculation. And we found that these can be retained to 40 days post inoculation and even up to 100 days post inoculation suggesting that these granulomas are very stable. And once that they form, once they form in the lungs, they appear to be very protective in preventing uh, lethal cryptococcal disease. And so um, now that we have kind of characterized the pathology of granuloma formation in this model, we were interested in exploring specific fungal features of the MAR1 mutant strain that may promote its containment within granulomas. And so we performed uh, a very a detailed phenotypic characterization of the marrow mutant strain in physiologically relevant conditions. And I'm just gonna show a few of the, the interesting observations that we made through this process. So we explored uh, the ability of the marrow mutant strain to form titan cells using an established in vitro titanization protocol that was developed by Liz Ballou's group. And we found that the marrow mutant strain is actually completely unable to form titan cells. Uh, in v and com completely able to form titan cells in this in vitro condition. And um, this actually supported our histopathology observations in which the MARO immune cells did not appear to form titan cells in vivo. Additionally, since we knew that um, the MARO immune strain had reduced capsule attachment from Shannon's work, we also looked at capsule architecture using scanning electron microscopy. We found that in in vitro host-like conditions, the MAR1 mutant strain is able to attach capsule, so it is not completely acapsular like the CAP59 mutant strain. However, the MAR1 mutant strain is unable to extend its capsule fibers to the same lengths as the wild type strain. And because of this, um, we think that this is at, and this extension is actually um, 
this lack of extension is actually uh, preventing appropriate shielding of immunogenic components of the MAR1 mutant cell wall. And so we found this to be collectively to be kind of interesting observations because we think that these defects in virulence factor employment uh, in conjunction with the defects in the MAR1 mutant cell wall that Shannon previously characterized are likely responsible for the enhanced immune response in MAR1 mutant strain inoculated lungs observed at three days post inoculation, despite the fact that there were tenfold fewer MAR1 mutant cells in the lungs at the same time point. So in other words, we think that these virulence factor defects and cell wall defects of the MAR1 mutant strain are uh, causing the MAR1 mutant strain to be more immunogenic than the wild type strain, and as a result, causing it to induce a more robust immune response in vivo. And then we also looked at the simple ability of the MAR1 mutant strain to grow in physiologically relevant conditions. So when we incubated our cells in liquid culture at the permissive temperature of 30 degrees and the more stressful temperature of 37 degrees Celsius, we found that the MAR1 mutant strain had some morphological defects, including cells with abnormal cell shape, cells with wide bud necks, and cells that failed to complete cytokinesis. When we quantified uh, these defects, we found that the MAR1 mutant strain had a significant increase in morph uh, morphological defects compared to the wild type strain at both temperatures, but this phenotype was the most severe at 37 degrees Celsius, demonstrating that the MAR1 mutant strain has some defects in cell cycle progression at mammalian body temperature. We furthermore found that these cell cycle progression defects result in a reduced growth rate of the MAR1 mutant strain compared to the wild type strain at 37 degrees Celsius. And um, we found this, this, again, very simple experiment, very simple observation to be interesting because we think that this growth defect may actually be responsible for the sustained decrease in MAR1 mutant fungal burden observed uh, throughout the course of infection, as the MAR1 mutant strain is likely not able to replicate as quickly as a wild type strain in the mammalian lung. And so in compiling all, this, uh, all these, the, uh, these different data, we hypothesize that there are specific features of the moral mutant strain that promote granuloma formation. And so we propose that the immunogenic cell surface of the moral mutant strain induces a robust, um, induces robust uh, fungal detection by the murine immune system, while its slow growth phenotype enables fungal containment by the murine immune system. And together, this combination of fungal factors promote fungal containment within these granulomas and actually prevent further proliferation into healthy lung tissue. And um, you know, these may be, these are interesting observations uh, just simply about the Marlon mutant strain itself. But um, we, you know, we wanted to know if they could be more significant if they're more broadly applicable. And so I be, it's incredibly important for me to mention that um, the that Mauricio Del Poitza's lab has previously developed a murine model of cryptococcal granuloma formation, which they've been characterizing for over a decade. Um, and in this model, this in this model, they find that inhalation infections with the GCS1 mutant strain, which lacks the sphygmolipid glucosal ceramide, induces granuloma formation in the marine lung. And they have found that. This is largely due to the fact that the GCS1 mutant strain actually arrests its growth uh, in the alkaline environment of the murine lung. And uh, their argument is that this uh, growth arrest actually enables fungal sequestration within granulomas. And so it appears from, you know, from our data and the uh, data from uh, the Del Poeta lab that potentially a reduced growth rate in vivo is a shared characteristic of fungi that induce granulomas in mice. Of course, though, this doesn't address any questions about granuloma formation in humans, and um, this is likely a very, you know, very um, complex uh, issue. But we have ha we have a fantastic undergraduate in the lab, Jackson Cathy, who has uh, begun probing questions about human granuloma formation by phenotyping cryptococcal isolates that have been taken directly from pulmonary granulomas. And he's found that these human granuloma isolates, uh, which are all shown in pink in these bar charts, phenotypically tend to act a bit more like the MAR1 mutant strain than our laboratory adapted wild type strain. And that these, uh, these isolates tend to have reduced titan cell formation and also reduced capsule extension compared to the wild type strain. And so this potentially suggests that 
these isolates ha have more immunogenic cell surfaces than our laboratory adapted wild type strain that we typically use as a control in murine infections. And so collectively, uh, we're, we're thinking that these converging observations suggest that a slow fungal growth rate and increased cell surface immunogenicity may be shared features of granuloma inducing fungi. And, um, and so taking this together, we have developed a very, very early um, and fluid working model of uh, gran granuloma formation in humans, in which we think that there are both um, host and fungal characteristics that contribute to granuloma formation. And so it's well documented um, in the literature that host immune response is a significant driver of cryptococcal infection outcomes, and that individuals who are um, immunocompromised typically will display fungal proliferation and dissemination, while those uh, that are immunocompetent will, uh, will form granulomas and contain fungi within those granulomas. But our work with the Marwan mutant strain and some of the preliminary work with these human cryptococcal uh, granuloma isolates suggests that there may also be some fungal features that promote granuloma formation. And that fungi that are slow growers in vivo and have immunogenic cell surfaces like the Marwan mutant strain may be more likely to be contained within granulomas. And um, again, this is a very early model and we're hoping to you know, expand on it by actually identifying the cellular role of the MAR1 protein um, in cryptococcus. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have time to get into that uh, unpublished work today, um, but I can just mention that we now know that MAR1 is required for maintaining mitochondrial homeostasis in response to host-induced stress. And so because of this, um, the MAR1 mutant strain also appears to have repressed mitochondrial activity in host-like conditions. And th this repressed mitochondrial activity actually appears to be driving the cell surface defects that we observe in this mutant strain. And so if we kind of take this into account, we can also potentially add to our working model that mitochondrial activity may also be a fungal characteristic that contributes to granuloma formation in which strains with um, high mitochondrial activity, like our laboratory adapted wild type strain, may be more prone to fungal proliferation dissemination while strains with repressed mitochondrial activity like the MAR1 mutant strain may be more prone to containment within granulomas. Um, and of course, this is, you know, there this are a lot of a lot of fun hypotheses to test with um, with this early model. And so some of our immediate next steps are to um, use some of the approaches we use to study the MAR1 mutant strain to similarly determine if our human cryptococcal granuloma isolates are um, similarly suppressed in their mitochondrial activity. And then we also plan to um, perform some mouse infections with other fungal strains that look like the Marwan mutant. So strains that have um, decreased growth rates, increased immunogenicity, and also decreased mitochondrial activity to see if they, these phenotypes are sufficient to induce um, granulomas in murine lungs. And so um, that is all, that's all that I have today. Um, and so this is all, again, this is all work that the, done in the OSPA lab that is a, um, you know, a product of a wonderful collaboration with the Wormley Lab. And so, um, yeah, so that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you for uh, your attention. All right. Thanks, Kella, for a great talk. Um, there are some questions in the chat already, but please continue entering questions into the chat and we'll take all questions after both speakers have presented. Um, so now I'm going to pass it off to Lillian, who will introduce our next speaker. Hi. It's my pleasure to introduce Vanessa Karina Alves da Silva. Uh, Vanessa completed her PhD from Fiocruz, Brazil in March 2020 under the supervision of Dr. Mauricio Rodriguez. And during this time, she had an opportunity to travel to Birmingham in Dr. Robin's May lab, where she completed part of her study. And then from September 2020, she joined the Bettina Fries Lab at Stony Brook University as a postdoctoral associate. So Vanessa, take it away. Thank you for your, um, the introduction. Um, uh, I would like to first thank you, the organizers, for inviting me to share my work here today. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about how 
uh, longevity in yeast can impact cell wall and also the vesicular intracellular trafficking in two human pathogenic yeasts, Cryptococcus pneumoformans and C. glabrata. So um, among the fungal pathogens that can cause um, life-threatening fungal diseases, there are two pathogenic yeasts that stand out as major um, pathogens. One of them is Cryptococcus pneumoformans um, that can cause up to 20% of mortality rate in the US and more than 50% um, in developed countries. And um, Candida glabrata, which is one emergent species that um, causes invasive, invasive uh, candida candidiasis and can reach up to 40% of mortality rate. And Candida glabrata is one um, non albican species that is really um, an important pathogen in hospitalized patients, especially with um, neutropenia. So cells of, due infection, cells of advanced age can accumulate in vivo due to selective pressures that eliminates young cells. Um, aging is a consequence of cell division and is a conserved natural process among, among eukaryotic cells. Um, so what I studied is something called replicative aging. And Replicative aging is a result of asymmetric cell divisions. So basically what happens is we have a mother cell and every time that the cells divide and generate a daughter cells, it gains one generation. And this continues happen um, until the, the cell reaches senescence and eventually dies. And in this graph, I show here about Candida glabrata and the advantage that Candida glabrata has um, um, in comparison to Sinuformis, for instance, is because every time that the cell divides, it gains a blood scar. And these blood scars means it has uh, uh, divided and it can be detected by staining with a calcofluor white here, you can see in blue. And interestingly, um, you can see during infection in, in a neutropenic mice and a wild type mice, um, the blood, blood scars increase, meaning the aged cells um, resist um, during infection. And here in yellow, you can um, compare also um, a isolate from a human sample. And you can see the number of blood scars are outnumbered in, in, in comparison to in vitro growth in laboratory. Um, the lifespan of an yeast, it varies dependently on the strain. However, in this graph here for pharmacy strains, as you can see, the average of a cell that a cell can live is about 25 to 30 generations. And why do old cells prevail during infection, not young cells? That's because advanced, advanced age yeast cells are an important contributor to pathogenesis. And I'll give you here three examples of why old cells can be more dangerous during infection. The first one is increased cell size. Um, so at zero generation, we have a remarkably smaller um, cell. Um, and when you reach 10 generation, you can see that this, um, the size can actually double or triple. And this is important because I, a bigger cell size can impact on the phagocytosis rate during infection. And once inside the phagocytic cell, the older cells actually have the potential to not be killed um, inside macrophages or inside of neutrophils in, case of, in the case of candida glabata. Um, this is uh, probably because of resistance to oxidative stress as we have seen previously. 
Another example is that old cells can actually have more tolerance to antifungals. Um, so you can see here in these two graphs, older cells are more resistant to fluconazole um, in way higher concentrations than younger cells. So recently also we've shown that um, old senioformin cells um, contribute to increased cell wall associated virulence factors. For instance, the molecule APP1 are overexpressed in older cells in comparison to younger cells, that, that is in senior formants. Um, and this protein APP1 is important for um, when it's overexpressed, actually reduces the, the uptake um, of the yeast uh, by macrophages. And interestingly, uh, the gene LEC1 and LEC2, which are important for the production of melanin, were also overexpressed. And that was actually um, associated with more melanin production from old cells. And melanin is present in cell wall of the senior forms. And interestingly, um, LACase, that the enzyme that it's responsible for the production of melanin has been found um, previously in extracellular vesicles released in cultures of senior forms. And those extracellular vesicles also care other viral factors such as GXM, which is the main polysaccharide of the senior forms capsule. And regarding the fungal cell wall of yeast cells, Basically, basically, it has the, the same components. However, it varies um, among fungal pathogens. And um, especially uh, regarding the arrangement and also the quantity of those components. So for instance, in Cryptococcus uniformis, we have um, in the inner layer, um, chitin, chitosan, the presence of melanin. In the outer layer, you can see uh, beta and alpha glucan. Whereas in Candida glabrata, the outer layer, as you can see here, this fibular, um, gorgeous layer, is mainly composed of actually monoproteins, whereas the inner layer um, is mostly composed of chitin and beta glucan. Um, interestingly, chitosan is only present in senior firmus cell walls. And the fungal cell wall is an important structure to be studied because it's a dynamic dynamic structure that can be regulated um, according to environmental stress, cellular morphology, cell growth, and also division. And that can be actually a really good target for new antifungal therapies and vaccine candidates. And despite, the, despite also the fact that um, it's one of the first interaction point of contact between fungal cells and mammalian cells. So based on that, um, we decided to investigate the longevity impact on the cell wall composition and architecture of senior forms in signal brata, and also the intracellular trafficking in vacuolar homeostasis during aging. So how do we isolate old generation cells? So first, we biotin label exponential cultural growth of fungal cells. And then we let them grow in synthetic media until we reach the desired generation. Um, so after that, we use magnetic beads. They are covered with streptavidin. The streptavidin are supposed to um, attach to the biotin label cells. And then we pass this culture um, in a um, column um, inside this magnetic field. So then the old cells that are labeled, they will bind in these columns and then the uh, young cells will be washed out of the system. And finally, we're going to, after that, um, elute the older mother cells. And for this study, we use um, the RC2 as an strain for senior formants and the BG2 um, for sigla brata. The older cells in this presentation represents 10 generations for senior formants and 14 generations for um, the sigla brata cells. So after isolating old 
from young cells, we have performed gene expression of biosynthesis of cell wall biosynthesis genes um, and analysis of the cell wall content, ultramicroscopy by TEM, and also we have analyzed the vacuum morphology and pH. So as expected, the regulation of cell wall biosynthesis genes were altered in older generation um, cells of Cryptococcus informis and Sigla brata. And especially uh, genes related to the chitin biosynthesis and the, its derivates, such as chitosan and catoligomeres, were overexpressed in older cells. Um, in line with these um, results, we could see that the cell wall architecture was remodeled during aging. So here, senior formants um, and sigla brata had an increase in chitin production. Um, the sigla brata, as expected, had more but scars. So as you can see here um, in blue, um, and its derivatives Chitoligomeres, that is like the breakdown of the chitin, were also uh, more present um, in older cells. Um, here in orange, you can see that in young, young cells, chitoligomeres were restricted to bud scars. However, in older cells, this, this was more, um, the stain was throughout the cell. And chitoligomeres in cryptococcus is also important for the anchoring of the capsule. Um, Regarding chitosan, it's another derivative of chitin, um, and it, it's extremely important for its new formants. Um, immunogenicity uh, was more remarkably increased in senior formants older cells. And regarding beta gluca and mannan, we haven't seen uh, through microscopy a big difference in between young and old cells for sigla brata. However, for senior farmers, we could see that the blood scars and the daughter cells were more stained than in young cells. Interestingly, uh, for old cells only, the mannan will also co-localize um, with the capsule. So the capsule is stained in green here and the mannan in red. And as you can see, um, only young cells had the but scars for daughter cells, but also old cells had these dots, meaning that the mana actually were more um, exposed in older cells. And since we could not um, analyze the beta glucan through um, using antibodies for um, identifying in um, senior pharma cells, we use this biochemical assay with aninyl blue to check on the quantity of beta-glucan. And um, as the other components, um, beta-glucan were more, um, were increased in older cells um, in comparison to young cells. So as an alternative approach to check on the levels of the cell wall components between young and old cells, we have performed pulse cytometry and we've seen an increase actually in all components of sigla brata and its neoformance and um, including beta glucan and monoproteins which could not be uh, verified by microscopy. Um, to characterize better the cell wall of young and old cells we performed STEM microscopy and as you can see here in the in the ultramicroscopy there are few uh, interesting characteristics. One of them is that indeed the older cells have a thicker um, cell wall um, in comparison to the young cells. And this grow is proportionally for the inner layer and the outer layer for senior farmers. It's not only the overgrowth. However, when we compare within groups of young and young and old and old, we could see that the outer layer actually is thicker than the inner layer. And that's true for both groups, um, young and old cells for senior forms. However, when we see sigla brata, uh, actually the outer layer of sigla brata 
was thicker for younger cells and not old cells. And that was not true for the inner part. So for the inner part of the cell wall for sigla brother, that was thicker for the older cells than when we compare for younger cells. Another interesting characteristic is that for the sigla brother, we have this waveness on the cell wall that's not seen um, for the younger cells. And that's probably because of the um, increase on blood scores. And within groups for sigla brata, we also see that actually the inner layer is um, increased um, in comparison to the outer layer within groups. Um, and, and lastly, we also have seen um, abundance of uh, extras of vesicles, particles like in the cytoplasm, which um, can be suggestive of extracellular vesicles. Um, and also this giant formation of, of the vacuole in older cells. Um, so despite the alteration of vacuole morphology that we have seen in older cells, we also could actually observe an increase in multivascular body-like uh, structures, which are called MPBs. And the MPBs are structure really important for secretion in yeast cells. And as you can see here, um, the older cells had a increase um, about like three times in older cells of MPB formation. And for um, Canada glabrata, it's increased from 4% of MPBs in older cells in young cells to actually almost 34% in older cells. And to continually to investigate the accumulation of uh, vesicles, of intracellular vesicles in older cells, we have performed um, this TEM, um, but this time with um, labeling, immunogold labeling of GXM. Since um, this polysaccharide are synthesized inside the cell and then exported through vesicles, um, to the extracellular space. And we actually see an uh, increase in intracellular GXM um, by the immunogold labeled in older cells. Um, this was in accordance with the overexpression of the gene SAC14, which is really important for um, conventional secretion in cryptococcal forms. Um, and then to um, make sure that we had actually an effect in the number and size of vacuoles, we have used um, this stain, this red stain, the FM464. And then we conclude doing um, a ratio of the vacuole area by the cell area that actually the increasing cell uh, vacuole is not proportionate to the increase of the cell area. So um, the, the vacuole is bigger now because only the cell gets bigger. Um, and that is true for both species. However, when we check the average of the vacuole per cell, we could see a decrease for older cells. And this is suggestive that the smaller vacuoles in younger cells actually get fused. Um, in older cells. And this, is, this can impact actually the vacuole pH homeostasis um, as um, occurs in old Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Once the cells grow older, the pH of the vacuole gets less acidic. And that was um, observed with the staining of kinin cream here in green. However, for C. arborata, we actually see a more acidic vacuole for younger cells and not older cells. So as take home messages that we have from this is that phenotypic modifications occur during replicative aging in two pathogenic yeasts, Cineoformis and Siglabrata. And during aging, the cell wall of Cineoformis and Siglabrata increases in thickness and present high levels of chitin and its, and its derivates, beta-glucan and mannan. 
And also, senior farmers and sigla brata exhibit drastic ultra structural changes, such as enlarged vacuoles and abundant vesicle like particles, suggestive of MVVs. Um, the vacuole number and pH homeostasis is also affected in old yeast cells. So then I would like to thank the Freeze Lab, especially Shomanon, who have done um, the co -alter authorship of this work with me, and also uh, our collaborators, Anna Savit and the Nozenchuk Lab, um, and the funding as well. So that's it. Thank you. All right, thank you for another great talk. Um, I'll take the first questions for Kala and then I'll send it back to Lillianne for some questions for Vanessa. So please enter your questions in the chat. Um, but let's start with a question from Lillianne for Kala, which was, does the MARM-1 mutant secrete more or less of the capsular material, so XOGXM, um, into the environment? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So that's some work that, um, that Shannon actually did uh, on her initial characterization of the Mara mutant strain. Um, it's, it looks like it secretes pretty much, you know, the same similar amount. Um, so it's, you know, it's making the same amount. It's just not attaching. Um, there does, if you actually like look at the, 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 uh, the blood, it looks like there's kind of a shift difference. Like, so that maybe the architecture of the capsule is a little bit different, but overall it looks like the same amount is being shed into the, like into the, the environment. Right. And then we have two related questions from Mariano Afiro and uh, Josh Kerkart. And uh, the first one from Mariano is, uh, have you tried treating MAR1 knockout infected mice at day 40 with an immunosuppressant? So did the fungi break out of the granuloma and cause lethality in those situations? Uh, that's a fantastic question. And I would, uh, these are a great experimental suggestion that I would, um, that I would like to try. We just have, we haven't yet been able to do that. Um, Right. And the related question from Josh is uh, thinking about the human populations that are susceptible to cryptococcus infection. Um, have you tested the MAR1 strain in a T cell deficient mouse model? And what are your role about your thoughts on the role of T cells in fungal induced granulomas? Yeah, another another great question. Um, and I think these are both really important important experiments that we need to do. Um, I, and I think doing that, you know, genetically using some type of T, T cell deficient background. Um, would be great. And also um, if, you know, doing some type of like steroid treatment or something like that to, to do it more chemically would be, um, would also be important. Um, my gap, you know, there isn't a ton of literature on cryptococcal granulomas, this, um, you know, at least compared to other granuloma inducing microbes like um, mycobacterium, but it appears that T cells are actually very, you know, it's not surprising, but they're actually very important for the maintenance of granuloma, of cryptococcal granulomas. Um, so it appears that they kind of, they make up um, the border of these granulomas. And it's actually been observed in humans that like if, if an individual is um, on a uh, antiretrovirals and um, they go off of them and uh, their viral, you know, their, their viral load increases, those, those T, the T cells will actually disappear from the granulomas and those granulomas can begin to break down um, in, in, like in human lungs. So um, I think that they're, you know, they're pretty important and probably is a big player as to why we see um, granuloma breakdown and dissemination upon uh, immunosuppression. Um, but, but we have, and then the one, the one thing I'll just mention um, that we did look at, so some work by, um, Galen Taus and Gary Huffnagel, has, they looked at um, the importance of GMCSF in maintaining granulomas um, in a, a, a different um, murine model. Um, and they saw that it was, you know, not surprisingly, but um, very important for the formation of granulomas. And we saw that that is also true for our model. So if we actually infect mice with the MAR1 mutants uh, that are deficient in GMCSF signaling, the granulomas will not form. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Lilian, would you like to take some questions for Vanessa? Yes, there is one question for Vanessa. Um, so it's a question from Jessica. So fascinating data. I'm very intrigued by how old cell might specifically upregulate cell wall related gene. Do you think that specific transcription factor are upregulated in age dependent manner? 
all my transcript, my transcriptional, post transcriptional regulation get less precise with age? That's a great question, Jessica. Um, thank you for that. Um, well, I think there is uh, some post transcription factors that can be involved in the regulation of some cell wall genes. There is this PUF4 um, gene, for instance, that is in re close relationship with the FKS1 um, genes. They are actually involved in the in the synthesis of beta glucan. And we haven't checked that, but probably there is something going on there and we aim to investigate that in, in the future more closely. But, but yeah, um, sometimes probably there is some, some post-transcription post factors uh, upregulated, involve it directly into that. Okay, I have another question. So you uh, you say that the the vesicle changes, the size of the vesicle in older cells become bigger, right? The size of oh, the cell, not, yeah. The yeah. size of the cell, yeah. Yeah. So does the content changes too? Like, have you compared the content of vesicle from older versus uh, younger cells? For example, saying if they are carrying capsule material, I can cap in cryptococcus is known as physical sometimes are containing capsule material. So do you think that older uh, vesicle from older versus young cells, are, the content is different? Yeah, uh, another great question, thank you. Um, that's something that we couldn't see for technical um, restrictions. We do have seen that there is an increase in intracellular um, vesicle-like particles, but to to allow us to verify on the extracellular vesicles in the culture or on the extracellular space, we cannot see right now because to isolate the, 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 the old cells, we have a really low yield. And also there is a problem of contamination with young cells. So after three hours, more or less, there is new buddings mm -hmm. and new um, younger cells will contaminate our culture. However, we are working in the modern Richard program um, that will um, give us a mutant that the daughter cells will be eliminated from the system. And then we can actually verify extracellular vesicles content and quantity outside of, of the older cells. But yes, we do have this hypothesis that the content will be actually um, different and it would be great like to verify if there is also coronal sensing between the vesicles from the older cells towards the younger cells. Jessica, I need a question for Kara. Uh, so a question from Matt Blanco it says, very nice talk. I'm wondering if you would see similar phenotypes in other mutants that struggle to produce enough energy. For example, other mutants in mitochondrial proteins or maybe non-essential metabolic enzymes. Um, another super. These are super super helpful suggestions, um, and I think that that's that's important to do as well. We ha so we've we started to do that chemically. Um, we actually inhibited uh, the electron transport chain with um, with different in, you know different inhibitors in the in the wild type stream background, and we see that that alone is actually sufficient to induce um, cell wall changes that uh, look like the Mar1 mutant strain. And um, so that's actually, and, and we're not the first ones to do that. Some uh, work out of Jim Cronstadt's lab has done that as well. And so it, it seems that if you do, you know, if you do kind of shut down uh, uh, respiration or like make, kind of impair it in some way that it, it makes um, the cell is, it is kind of responding to that in some way. Um, and then we've also, um, you know, if you have any suggestions for mutants to use, I would love to, I would love to hear them. Um, we've been, I've, I've started doing a little bit of work with uh, the SAD2 mutant strain, which is the mitochondrial superoxide dismutase, um, because we've seen that the MAR1 mutant has uh, an increase in intracellular reactive oxygen species. And that mutant also seems to have some cell, wall, some cell wall defects, some growth defects that look a little bit like the MAR1 mutant strain, but it's definitely something that we need to, we need to um, keep working on. Thank I have a both. slightly related question. And that yeah. is, is the formation of the cryptococcal granuloma protective? Um, so if you infect mice with a MAR1 knockout strain, 
and then later infect them with wild type or they were mm -hmm. somewhat resistant to wild type infection. Yeah, uh, I, and I, I, I don't know, we haven't done that experiment yet, um, but so I can tell you what my guess would be. My guess would be that they would, I'm gonna guess they wouldn't be. And I, and I, at least with the typical doses of fungi that we usually give, so usually anywhere from like 10 to the fourth to 10 to the fifth fungi, I don't, I think that a lot of this, um, my, my gut and kind of what I've seen my, is that a lot of this is the fung is a fungal, um, you know, it, it's about the, the fungus and the fungus that's actually in the um, do, being infected. So I don't I don't think that those granules would be protective for a later um, a later wild type infection. But we haven't done those yet. Yeah. All right, and one more question from Mariana Fierro. It was he says I'm intrigued by the requirement for GMCSF. Do you know which cells produce the GMCSF required for the granuloma formation? Yeah, we um, we we don't know um, which which what which cells are actually um, producing it in in uh, at least in our model. Um, I mean, it could be we know that macrophages, T cells, natural killer cells, all those important immune cells make GMCSF. Um, so I don't know which cells are coming from, but we have seen that uh, you know it's it is it's produced in. Um, it's induced by cryptococcal infections, and we actually see it's produced slightly more um, with in our murine model with the more mutant strain. So that would be a great experiment to kind of isolate isolate different cell populations and look to see, um, you know, look to see, to kind of compare GM CSF production between them. I hadn't thought of that, so thank you for that suggestion. Great, and uh, Lillian, uh, you like to take uh, the question? Panel? Yes, there's a question for from Mariano. How old is too old? Is there a point where old cells be, begin to have decreased weakness compared to younger cells, despite having some advantage you described? Um, great question. Again, uh, we haven't checked um, the so the oldest that I uh, well, it first it varies depending on the strain. How old can be too old? Like for some strains can be. Um, half of the lifespan or other strains and I'm afraid I don't have like a straight answer for that yet but the, the cells that we actually work with it's more like middle middle life cells not really old cells they're older in comparison to really younger cells um and and one technical issue about that is because you lose a bunch of cells in every isolation. So to actually be able to work with really older cells, um, we would have like a, such a small yield. Um, but the, 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 the mathematical model to, to verify um, what type of cells would be like prevailing during um, infection would be more like middle life cells, not really too old cells. So that's my, I don't know if I have answered that question, but that's more or less what um, I can explain. There was another question, but you alluded to that before. I don't know if you have any other comment. It's a question on extra physical, the, the physicals. Mm -hmm. extracellular vesicles and it's saying thank you for an interesting talk i probably missed it but do you have any idea or already data indicating a signaling function of the extracellular vesicles what will happen if you apply these to younger cells could they probably influence or induce cell wall formation mm -hmm. yeah um that would be so interesting to check, like how the vesicles from older cells can impact the younger cells. What I can say for the literature is actually there is a paper from Juliana Hughes on Arspergillus vesicles that she has checked that um, actually the vesicles um, can create, um, can generate, let's say, like new cell wall in Aspergillus, like for these spores. So she has worked with like giving vesicles for um, cells without like the cell wall, no, no, with, with really fragile cell wall, and then the cells could actually regain um, the, the cell wall. So I think there the the that that's our hypothesis, like that that's. What we have, uh, as I suggest from our results, is that actually the the 
the increase in intracellular vesicles is something that can be related indirectly yet um, to, the, to the thickness of the cell wall. All right, if there are further questions, feel free to turn on your mic. Um, otherwise, a huge thank you to both our speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right, we'll see everyone next month.